This podcast is an invitation to feel and experience the souls of famous old Hollywood homes and to have an in-depth journey to the areas where they're located through interviews with longtime residents. Either you're a fan of old Hollywood in Los Angeles planning to have a vacation or an even bigger step, considering a certain area for your future home. This is your opportunity to receive valuable information and insightful advice you won't find anywhere else. Hello, hello, and welcome to my podcast. Are you in the mood for California? Today we'll explore and feel Disneyland, followed by an interview with incredible Rosanna Norton. When I was 13, we moved up to um, Benedict Canyon, up on the mountain, and I really hated it. I just hated it because when we lived in Hollywood, you could just go everywhere. You could walk down the hill and there was a bus stop, take the bus anywhere. I used to go ice skating at the Polar Palace. There was this ice skating rink that Sonia Henney had built for her movies. It's a set for all her movies. And I could go everywhere. But no. So then we moved up to the mountains up in Benedict Canyon. And my father said, oh, well, you can either have a horse or a pool to make it it up to you. So I said, oh, of course, I'll take a horse. Masha Korpacheva is a California-based realtor and a member of the National Association of Realtors in Los Angeles. She's an advocate for selling and buying homes with soul and practicing mindfulness in real estate. With master's degrees in spiritual psychology and linguistics, Masha brings all of her skills to work with her clients. An intuit and empath, she has touched many lives with her outstanding ability to see beyond the visible and helping to come to better understanding of issues and their resolutions. An adventurous world traveler, from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania to exploring the Galapagos Islands, Masha has a particular passion for the City of Angels. Having landed in this paradise and adopted it as her home, she's been sharing old Hollywood stories since 2007. In the mood for California, feel the soul of old Hollywood. And now, are you ready to experience Disneyland? Let's step into the enchanting world of Disneyland, where the magic began over 60 years ago on a 160-acre piece of land that once thrived as an orange grove in Southern California. What started as a whimsical dream during a carousel ride in Griffith Park in the 1940s became the grandeur of Disneyland, a theme park that has cast its spell on more than 700 million visitors since its opening in 1955. The architectural metamorphosis from an orchard to fantasy land is as captivating as the park itself. Walt Disney's vision took shape in Anaheim where 160 acres of orange and walnut trees were transformed into the beloved Disneyland we know today. The park's entrance, marked by a tunnel and a plaque that invites visitors to leave today and enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy, sets the stage for the magical journey that awaits. The opening day, July 17, 1955, was meant to be a preview for invited guests, but it turned into a saga of challenges. Black Sunday faced scorching temperatures, gate crashers, sinking heels, and even a plumber's strike that led to a tough choice between working toilets and drinking fountains. Walt Disney, undeterred, delivered a dedication that set the tone for Disneyland's resilience. Amidst its challenges, Disneyland continued to evolve, becoming a trailblazer in theme park innovation. The Matterhorn bobsled ride, introduced in 1959, 
not only thrilled visitors, but also became the first tubular steel coaster, influencing the design of modern roller coasters worldwide. The Enchanted Tiki Room, debuting in 1963, showcased Disney's pioneering audio animatronics technology, bringing three-dimensional birds, flowers, and tiki gods to life. Pirates of the Caribbean, making its debut in 1967, remains a timeless favorite, inspiring blockbuster movies and setting the bar for immersive storytelling in theme park attractions. Disneyland's architectural milestones are etched in its history, from the Main Street Electrical Parade, adorned with over 500,000 twinkling lights in 1972, to the iconic Space Mountain coaster blasting off in Tomorrowland in 1977, each edition pushed the boundaries of creativity and technology. The park's popularity soared with milestones like welcoming 150 million visitors in 1976 and the grand celebration of its 50th anniversary in 2005. Disneyland's influence extended beyond its gates, inspiring themed lands, rides, and attractions around the globe. In 2019, the park welcomed Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, a testament to Disneyland's enduring ability to transport visitors to far-off galaxies. However, the park faced an unprecedented closure in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, joining a short list of historical closures that included events like the Kennedy assassination and September 11 attacks. Having emerged from its temporary closure, Disneyland is once again inviting guests to experience the magic. The architectural legacy of Disneyland continues to shape the world of theme parks, ensuring that the happiest place on earth remains an ever-evolving masterpiece of imagination and wonder. And here we are. Welcome to Los Angeles. I'm absolutely delighted to have Rosanna Norton with me today. Rosanna Norton is a renowned costume designer. She earned a nomination alongside Eloise Jensen for Best Costumes at the 55th Academy Awards for her exceptional work on the film Tron. Her creative contributions extend to various iconic films, including The Flintstones, The Brady Bunch Movie, Gremlins 2, and Carrie. Notably, the unforgettable prom dress from Carrie remains etched in memory. Hailing from Los Angeles, Rosanna witnessed the city's transformative journey. Her father, the coordinating architect for Disneyland, and her time at UCLA when Jim Morrison sometimes crashed at her apartment add intriguing layers to her fascinating life story. Rosanna will share with us what it feels like to live in Los Angeles and how the city has evolved over the years. Hello, Rosanna. Hello. I was so looking forward to our conversation today. Well, good. And thank you so much for finding the time. And uh, you have just so many stories to share. Oh, yeah. So I cannot <laughs> wait to ask you all of my questions. Okay, <laughs> ask away. So being born in Los Angeles, you've had the unique experience of witnessing the city's evolution and diverse cultural influences. Maybe you could please share what it's like to be a native Angelina and maybe describe the different vibes and faces of the city, let's say, to someone who has never been here. When I think about being a child, I remember it was really smoggy. We all had incinerators in our backyard, if you can believe that. There were these ovens where they, you put all the garbage in there and burned the garbage. 
Mm -hmm. I remember it being smoggy. I lived in the Hollywood Hills right above Sunset near La Cienega in West Hollywood near the riot on the Sunset Strip Mm -hmm. that happened later. And it was fabulous there. It was really nice. You could go anywhere in the city on the bus. You go downtown, you go to the beach, you go everywhere. And then when I was 13, we moved up to um, Benedict Canyon up on the mountain. And I really hated it. I just hated it because when we lived in Hollywood, you could just go everywhere. You could walk down the hill and there was a bus stop, take the bus anywhere. I used to go ice skating at the Polar Palace. There was this ice skating rink that Sonia Henney had built for her movies. It's a set for all her movies. And I could go everywhere. But no. So then we moved up to the mountains up in Benedict Canyon. And my father said, oh, well, you can either have a horse or a pool to make, <laughs> <laughs> to make it up to you. So I said, oh, well, of course, I'll take a horse. So that you can get to places. Well, yeah. I mean, you'd think, but then you can't because, no, it's true. Where are you going to go? And then when you get there, because I used to ride the horse, I'd ride the horse over to my friend's house, but then I'd have to tie the horse up to the hitching post. Right. And then the horse would shit on the ground. And the horses stand, I mean, it was ridiculous. Right. So we would go riding. And and so then when we wanted to go to the store to get some candy or get some anything, get some beer. No, we didn't have any <laughs> beer. But all the way, well, I don't know, maybe. But anyway, we would ride our horses. We would ride our horses to the valley. We'd ride over the canyon. We'd ride down to the valley. And one of us would hold the horses. And the other one would go in the store and buy food and candy and stuff. It was kind of silly. And then... um So I moved away from there. Okay, so but you stopped hating, though, it, it, after a time. Yeah, I guess. I sort of always... Well, no, I mean, the thing is, I really had to drive. Mm-hmm. So I told my mother, because my sisters didn't like it either, and they had they always needed to be picked up at their friends' houses and driven around. So my mother taught me to drive when I was 12. Mm-hmm. So I learned to drive. So I just drove. So I got to drive everywhere. And I, she hated, my mother hated driving, and I liked to drive. So I would drive, and I'd pick up my sisters, and I'd you know drive my friends around. And the, up in Benedict Canyon, then, it was outside of Beverly Hills. And we had these permits on our cars that said Benedict Canyon Association. So the cops didn't bother us. Mm-hmm. The Beverly Hills cops, we could drive down the hill and the cops didn't stop us to see if we had driver's licenses or not. Very nice. Yeah, which was really nice. Uh-huh. And so I learned to just go everywhere in my car, in somebody's car. Nice. Yeah, and that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> and after Benedict Canyon, uh, where did you move? Well, then I moved. Well, I was still at UCLA. And then... I moved into an apartment on Clark Drive, Mm -hmm. you know, when I'm still a student. So, you know, it's where the Beverly Center is now. Right. They tore all that that whole neighborhood down to build the Beverly Center. That's where Jim Morrison used to come over and visit me. Oh, interested. Very interested. Tell us more. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I met him. We were both students at UCLA and I used to go to the the doors used to play at the London Fog on the Sunset Strip. Mm -hmm. So Jim Morrison would like follow me home. To my well, he didn't have a home then. He he was sort of homeless, mm. unhoused, as we say today. So and, he was couch surfing, probably. Well, he mostly stayed in the bed, not so much on the couch. Okay. But <laughs> you really must know. But no, he was really great. I mean, he was such a genius, really an incredible person. And it was so sad that he was an alcoholic and you know, kind of died young and all. Right. Yeah. So but, what kind of person was he? A really shy person, weirdly. Mm-hmm. Kind of shy and really sweet and nice. And, you know, it's hard to think of a person like that being shy. Right. Up on the stage like that. But I think he'd like close his eyes and not look at the audience so much or something. I don't know. Uh-huh. But he was really great. But at that time, you already sensed that he was a genius. Of course. Well, he only had to go to the, see the show. I mean, and he wrote poems and everything. And of course, he was a genius. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, he was great. I mean, those shows were just fantastic i think they did they didn't tape as many as they should have i think there's some tapes of them Mm -hmm. but yeah at the london fog because we used to hang out on the sunset strip Uh you just go down to the sunset strip once it got dark and they had a riot down there at one time on the sunset strip and you know and we just would go to all the different clubs we just hike up and down the street and like he sings that song show me the way to the next whiskey bar Uh oh don't ask why that was what it was like well he was going to the whiskey bars and show me the way to the next little girl and so on. So I was part of that. Wow. Yeah. And how do you think knowing Jim Morrison uh, influenced your life or your career maybe? 
Not that much. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew him, you know, and we were friendly until we sort of weren't, you know, and then it got kind of old. Mm-hmm. It, it got old and I, he was a little bit, I don't like to use the word, well, abuse. I mean, he, he would get mad sometimes and he just moody, mm-hmm. you know. And so, I mean, his, his music is great. I still listen to the music. Right. I, I guess that's an influence on anybody. Yes, that's the biggest I don't think legacy. he really influenced me as far as like being a costume designer or anything. I didn't know I was going to be a costume designer then. Oh, okay. So how did you come up like with the idea of being a costume designer and of pursuing this career? But kind of by accident. Huh. I um when I was my senior year at UCLA, I met these two friends of mine. We opened a store on Fairfax. We so I made these dresses. Mm-hmm. It was a, a called "I'm a Hog for You, Baby." Was the name of the store on Fairfax, right across from Cantor's Deli. And we made it was called the home of the famous thirteen dollar dress. Mm-hmm. So we made all these mini dresses, and I had a store, and I started. And I realized I'd been in college all this time, taking all these classes and painting and so forth. And then I got, you know, we had this store and we were making money. And it was so great. I was like, wow, mm-hmm. making money is really fun. <laughs> I, and, and it's it's not as hard a work as going to college. Right. I didn't have to prepare for tests. I didn't have to study or anything. I just, we just made clothes. We just, you know, I'd cut the clothes at my house and we had these seamstresses and they'd make these dresses and we'd sell them in the shop and we'd work in the shop and it was really fun. Mm-hmm. And Cher came into the shop one day and she bought all these dresses and we had to restock. I mean, it was really fun. Wow. So yeah. what was your first job as a costume designer, actually, you know, after uh, running a shop? Well, I got at UCLA, I met my ex-husband, Bill Norton, and he was in the film school and we got married and, and he was making, he made this movie, Cisco Pike. He got at Columbia Pictures. And so I just said to the producer, Jerry Harris, I was just crazy. And I said, why don't you let me be the costume designer? Wow. I'll design the costumes and I'll be the art director too. I'll design the sets too. And Jerry Ayers, wonderful Jerry Ayers, he let me do it. Wow. I know. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. So it was nepotism. So it was pure nepotism. So we did that movie and then the you rest know, is history. And the rest is history. That's what it takes sometimes. A person who knows you, a person who believes in you, and they tell you, yes, go ahead. You can do it. Yeah. I know. That's all it took. Jerry Ayers, RIP. I mean, he was such a great guy. What an incredible story. I know. And then they got busted, too, because I wasn't in the union. And so when the movie came out and they gave me this title called Design By, uh-huh. which is sort of they thought it would be it wouldn't have much meaning. So it, it wouldn't matter. Right. But then they got fined by the union. Mm, well. But then I'm sure you became part of the union. So mm-hmm. and things like that it wouldn't happen anymore. Well, that wasn't easy getting in the union. Uh-huh. No, because. In those days, the union was run by Sheila O'Brien. She ran the union. She and Edith had and Howard Shoup, and they ran the Costume Designers Guild. Mm-hmm. And she'd have the meetings at her house. I mean, it was a really small guild then. Mm-hmm. So I went over and I just to- I told her my sad story. I said, look, I have to get in the union. Please let me join the union. And I had done this movie, Phantom of the Paradise, by that time. Mm-hmm. And so... They people talked about maybe getting an Academy Award nomination for that because it had really good costumes. So she gave in. She let me join the union. She was so nice. And then she got me into the Academy and she got me into the Academy. And so, um, no, it was really great. Wonderful. So yeah. you were talented. You were lucky. I was so, lucky. And I was all, really lucky. All the doors were opening for you. Well, my ex-husband, Bill Norton, he, well, we knew a lot of people. You know, we knew a lot of people in Hollywood in the business and we knew people from UCLA. And so we knew Brian De Palma and he was nice enough to let me be the, and we knew um, Dick Blackburn who did this movie called The Secret Curse of Lamora, which you probably haven't seen, but it was this really, you know, low budget underground kind of movie. And so though they recommended me to Brian De Palma and then he let me do Phantom of the Paradise and Carrie, Mm -hmm. which is really good. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's talk a little bit about Carrie. Okay. Because, you know, her prom dress uh, is so iconic. So how did you come up with this design? Well, it needed to be homemade. So I thought, okay, what kind of a dress can I make at home? I mean, I can sew, you know, and so, and then I talked to Stephen King and in the book, the dress is red. And, you know, cause Stephen King, we talked to Stephen King. He wasn't so famous then. And I said, you know, the, the blood's not going to show on the red dress. Mm-hmm. Also, 
with Stephen King in the book. Have you read the book? Yes. Carrie, yeah. And remember, Carrie is like ugly. Mm-hmm. And yet the movie's different. Well, movies are always different from books. Yes. But anyway, so I just thought, okay, a pink dress will be nice and it'll show the blood. Right. And it'll look homemade. Mm-hmm. And we only had two dresses, which was really, because the budget was really low on that movie. Mm-hmm. And so they, they, I mean, it seems amazing to me now that they wouldn't pay for another dress. They cost like a hundred bucks. Right. But anyway, I mean, I had some more fabric and I thought, okay, if a push comes to shove and we need a third or fourth dress, I'll just take my sewing machine down to the set and I'll just sew another one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Very smart. Yeah. So you actually consulted with Stephen King yeah. on the design of the costume sure. for the movie. Well, you have to. I mean, that's where the ideas come from. The right. Or right. the book. Wow. So it must have been a very inspiring collaboration. Oh, sure. Who doesn't love Stephen King? He's inspirational. So what was the most interesting thing that you were inspired by, maybe, by Stephen King? Well, the book is really incredible. Right. I mean, the book is amazing. And the script, you know, the script was really pretty close to the book. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, you know, whenever you do costumes, it's the script. Mm -hmm. You know, like in real estate, they say location, location, location. Right, right. In movies, they say script, script, script. Right. And and that's it. Because you get a script and then you have to break it down and you figure out how many story days there are. There were four story days in Carrie, for example. You have to figure out how many costumes you need, who the extras are, who the cast is. Right. And then you design things around that. Mm-hmm. But like sometimes you have the script, but you don't have like the author of the script, like right next Usually to Usually you don't. In fact, it's funny because a lot of times I'll ask to talk to the screenwriter. Uh-huh. Because the screenwriters, once they've written the script, they've submitted the script, the script is accepted, they're doing the script, they disappear. You never hear right, from them. Right, right. Oftentimes I would, I'd ask if I can have the number of the screenwriter, if I can talk to the screenwriters to see what they we're trying to do. Correct. So that's why I thought it was interesting to see what your collaboration with Stephen King was like, because he actually came up with all these characters. Sure, and his imagination. Did. That's right. So what was it like to actually be speaking to him and discussing the characters and the way he saw them? Well, it was great. It was great. Stephen King, I mean, is a really fantastic author. And of course, he's brilliant and he's fun. He was really nice. I mean, we were young kids then. And we, you know, no, it was great. So you enjoyed working with him? Oh, hell yeah. Uh, and I enjoy working with Brian De Palma. I enjoy working with everyone. Wow. You have to. If you don't, you're in trouble. And then you have to start lying mm-hmm. and cheating. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> but you don't want to do so much. I hear you. If you can help it. But sometimes you have to lie. Am I looking too fat? No. No. (laughs) Does the skirt make me look fat? No. (laughs) Very interesting. So your life in Los Angeles, you know, uh, being a native here, you know, and it just, uh, you know, has spent so many years and you have experienced so many uh, different eras of Los Angeles and working with various people. But then your father was actually an architect uh, for Disneyland. Could you please share a little bit more well, about that? When I was a kid, my father was coordinating architect of Disneyland. And what that really means is he got the building permits. I mean, see, Disney had these Imagineers, these people that were artists, and they designed sets. You know, they designed animation. They Mm -hmm. did animation and stuff. And so they would draw pictures of, say, the castle at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. But then there weren't blueprints. So what my father did was he was an architect. So he drew, drafted the blueprints mm-hmm. and got the building permits. And they built Disneyland in a year. Oh, my God. In one year. you kidding. No. <gasps> and what I remember is that my grandparents lived in La Habra, which is right near Disneyland, mm-hmm. and my mother's parents. And so I remember that my father was gone the whole year. He stayed at their house in La Habra because it was like half, you know, 15 minutes from Disneyland. Right. And we lived in West Hollywood. It was so it was really far. So, yeah, I mean, it was incredible. Do you know by any chance how much it cost to, to, make, to, to build Disneyland in one year? I'm sure I could look it up on my phone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know offhand. That a lot. is incredible. Yeah, and that I went to huge. the yes, and my sisters and I went to the um opening day. Mm-hmm. And when you see the movie of all the kids running into Disneyland, I'm in there. Oh my god! You can't really tell it's me, but it is. Wow! You have to trust me on that. I will trust you. <laughs> and so maybe your father shared some stories with your mom. I'm sure you were very little at that time, but well, I was ten. I was pretty old. I was, yeah, I can understand things. So were there? some interesting stories that he shared well he said one of the things that was really hard was on that 
jungle ride, they have these hippopotamuses that go under the water. Mm -hmm. And what was really hard was to make the motors on all those things work underwater. Mm -hmm. That was really, a. my father was also an engineer. Mm -hmm. So they really, I mean, they'd never done anything like that before. Now it's kind of a common thing, those dark rides. Right. But so it was really challenging. So they were the pioneers of engineering. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and and the, they built that uh, Skyway thing. I mean, no, it's the whole thing was just amazing. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't really, my father didn't really get to design that much, mm-hmm. in a sense. So, but he got to implement and to yeah, think how to things would work. Mm-hmm. That's right, make things work mm-hmm. and get the building permit, which was really hard. Try to get a building permit someday. And you'll see, you know, they really make you wait and the inspectors won't come. And in fact, my father had other jobs like that. Mm-hmm. Like on the the San Ocean Park Pier, mm-hmm. he like inspected. He worked for the building department ultimately because mm-hmm. the building department they knew him from Disneyland, and so they hired him to ins- become a building inspector. Mm. So then he would inspect things like other amusement parks and oh. and things like that. So it was kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. But did he enjoy his work? Oh yeah. Oh he loved it. Oh yeah, he loved it working. So you never uh, aspired to be an architect or an engineer oh, I yourself. I could not be an architect. I mean, it's you know, no, I would love to be an architect, but it's too hard. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I could do it now because I have this phone and I have this laptop and I have this computer. Because now they do everything, you know, on nobody does like big drawings. Right. Not a drafting table anymore. Yes. No, I would love to design buildings. It would be great. <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> well, you're all about money. design. That's yeah. wonderful. So, you know, it's a similar thing. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright, he didn't want to make closets in his house. And Frank Lloyd Wright was a designer. And he thought he, when he had a client, he should design their clothes mm-hmm. as well. And they wouldn't have closets and their clothes would hang would be outside, you know, outside the closet. He thought they should be on display in the house. Right. It would be part of the interior design. That's right. That's right. Very smart because he designed all, furniture as he designed well. Furniture and houses and windows and maybe cars. I mean, there was nothing, frankly. And, you know, and that's the thing about being a designer. Yes. You design a life in a way. You design a lot of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what would you say was the most important thing in your illustrious uh, career? Because you designed some iconic movies like Tron and Gremlins uh, 2 and Carrie, of course, uh, that we already talked about. Uh So what do you think uh, was, besides being lucky and besides being talented and hardworking, what were the things that really kept you going? What was essential in your career? The money. (laughs) (laughs) I had to make money. You know, no, I mean, I had to make money. And I've done some really terrible movies. But when, the, and the, maybe the costumes were good on a terrible movie, but then I don't take the blame. But then if it's a really good movie, I, I take the credit. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. But besides the money, what do you think inspired you to continue working? And uh, what would be your advice to, uh, you know, aspiring uh, costume designers? How to make it in this business? How to Boy, be successful? It's hard. You know, it's really hard. You know, it's, I don't know. I, I think people have to really, well, one way to do it, I think people can get jobs as interns and work for free and make friends with people and kiss up to people and, and make their life easy. And then they give them a job, a real job. You know, I mean, it's hard and you have to be friendly and you have to be nice. Mm-hmm. It helps to be good looking and really friendly with all the crew and, you know, just make yourself indispensable. Right. Tom Hanks has just written a book about mm-hmm. this called The Making of a Major Motion Picture. Everyone should read that book Mm -hmm. and find out how to get a career in movies. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes. I just read this book last week. I got it from the library. Wow. So to be indispensable and to be of service, to be be useful, to be useful Uh and to be pleasant. Yeah. So those are all the things that really helped you uh, with your career as well. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and laugh at their jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. It is. <laughs> so having lived in Los Angeles your entire life, if a person has never been here, what would you tell them the city is about? So when I was in Thailand and people were coming here and I met this guy in Hawaii and they said, what will I do if I first come to L.A.? Mm-hmm. I said, OK, get a car. Like rent a car, or if you can't drive, get a, some kind of ride or something. They didn't have Ubers then. And then 
Start on Sunset Boulevard downtown where Sunset starts and drive all the way out Sunset and drive all the way out Sunset to the beach. Mm-hmm. And you'll really see all of Los Angeles. You'll go from this sort of crummy area, you know, downtown, which used to, well, I mean, it's pretty fancy now. And then you drive all the way down, you go past the Sunset Strip, you go through Beverly Hills, you go through Bel Air. And if you want to go up in Bel Air and see the star, movie stars' homes, and then you can, you know, drive down all the way down to the beach. Right. And then, and then you see sort of the spine of LA. That's right. Yeah, that's what I would do. What? That's great, what they should do. Yes. What great advice. And then they can go in the water and then go swimming at the beach. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this advice. Like the spine of LA, taking sunset all the way from like uh-huh. downtown to the beach and just jump in the beach. Jump in the water. And uh, Los Angeles will open up to you. Yeah, that's it's right. Beautiful. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. You're welcome. And My pleasure. Sharing your stories and sharing, you know, um, your career, your Los Angeles. Um, it was uh, such a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, son. You're welcome. Bye-bye. What happened? Thank you very much for tuning in to Feel and Experience Disneyland and a conversation with my special guest, Rosanna Norton. If you enjoy my podcast, In the Mood for California, please Sign up for future episodes at your preferred platform and please leave your feedback. I really appreciate your time and support. You can follow me on Instagram at In the Mood for California and check out my website www.inthemoodforcalifornia.com. I'm a realtor with Beverly and Company Luxury Properties and my license number is 019. 019- 78714. Selling and buying homes with soul is not just my real estate strategy. It is an intuitive and holistic approach that embraces your values, aspirations, and conscious intentions. If you want to discover the power of mindfulness in your real estate journey with my compassionate guidance, I'm here for you. In the next episode, get ready to explore the wonders of Sherman Oaks. So looking forward to sharing this thrilling experience with you. In the Mood for California, feel the soul of old Hollywood 